Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Our text for today is found in verses 48 through 59. We'll read through our text, beginning at verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How then can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In these verses, we're given an intimate picture of what it means to believe. These words not only illustrate truth that can give eternal life, but they also illustrate that which can satisfy our souls most deeply. In verse 48, Jesus continues with a metaphor he introduced earlier in this chapter, saying, I am the bread of life. This is the day after Jesus had fed the great multitude in the wilderness by multiplying the bread and the fish. The crowd had followed him out there into the wilderness because of the signs they saw him doing on the sick. And after the miracle of the loaves, they followed Jesus across the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum in search of more bread. So Jesus taught them about a far greater bread that could satisfy our soul's greatest need. In verse 49, Jesus said, Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. Now, pointing out a somber fact about the history they celebrated each year at Passover when God delivered their ancestors from slavery and fed them heavenly bread in the wilderness until they entered the promised land. As miraculous as manna was, everyone who ate it died. And so even if Jesus gave this crowd the physical bread that they were seeking for the rest of their lives they would still die. This is because manna doesn't overcome that which came into the world through sin. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the Apostle Paul explains that sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. In order for death to be overcome, sin must be dealt with. And unless that happens, eating a heavenly diet of miraculous food every day of your life won't keep you from dying. So in verses 50 and 51, Jesus declares that this is the bread that came down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus, not the man in the wilderness, or any supernatural provision from God, is the bread from heaven who delivers us from death. 
the very reason the Son of God took on human flesh was to overcome sin and death at the cross. He didn't become flesh in order for God to communicate to humanity. God has communicated to humanity from the beginning. When He first created Adam and Eve and would walk with them in the cool of the day, and throughout the centuries before Christ came, God spoke through the prophets. The Son of God didn't take on flesh primarily so that God could communicate with man, which He had already done. But primarily, He took on flesh so that He could die for us. This is the bread that He gives for the life of the world. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, Jesus says. Bread which was broken for us at the cross. So that one may eat of it and not die, he says, because through his sacrifice, sin, which brought death into the world, has been overcome, reversing death for those who believe. But in verse 52, upon hearing this, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Once again, as we've seen happen several times before in John's Gospel, Jesus is misunderstood by this crowd in the most crudely literal way. Blind to the true spiritual meaning of His words, they think that Jesus is advocating some form of cannibalism. But I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't try to correct their misunderstanding. In fact, in verse 53, Jesus expands on the metaphor, which results in even greater misunderstanding and causes even greater offense. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Jesus stresses the importance of His words with that introduction, truly, truly, I say to you, and then He states an absolute necessity, stating it negatively, saying, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and unless you drink His blood, you have no life in you. If a person doesn't eat His flesh, and if a person doesn't drink His blood, they have no life, because... Jesus is that which the world can't live without. Also, Jesus adds the necessity of drinking His blood, which would have pushed the Jews over the edge. That is because it was forbidden in the law to eat flesh with the blood. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 23 says, Only be sure that you do not eat the blood. For the blood is the life, and you shall not eat the life with the flesh. But because the crowd fails to see the true spiritual meaning of the metaphor, what Jesus is telling them seems to them to go against God's law. Yet Jesus doesn't soften His words, and He doesn't hold back. But in verse 54, he continues to stress this absolute necessity, this time saying it positively when he says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now we need to pay attention to this verse because it helps us understand what it means to eat his flesh and drink his blood. This is because verse 54 of our text is almost identical to verse 40 of this sixth chapter. In verse 40, Jesus said, Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. So according to verse 40, 
Those who believe in the Son have eternal life, and those who believe in the Son will be raised up on the last day, which is exactly what verse 54 tells us about those who feed on the Son's flesh and drink His blood. Now, Jesus is not teaching two different ways of salvation here, either by believing in Christ or by eating His flesh and drinking His blood. These are not two different ways of being saved. These are two ways of saying the exact same thing. Eating His flesh and drinking His blood maintain that salvation is by faith in Christ alone. One is a metaphor that illustrates the other in order to help us better understand what it means to believe and how faith in Christ can transform our lives. We start to really see this in verse 55 when Jesus adds, For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. His flesh is true food, and His blood is true drink. There is no other food or drink that can be called true in this way. Because while food can sustain physical life, and while food can satisfy physical hunger, food cannot heal. Our brokenness and food cannot keep us from dying. Because food can't deal with our sin, which causes not only death, but causes all our brokenness, all our misery, all our pain, all of our struggles. And so no other food or drink can really be called true. Because they are only broken representations of what true food and true drink can really do for us. This is what all food and all drink symbolizes and points towards, but cannot give. No other food or drink can take away your sin. No other food or drink can cleanse your soul. No other food or drink can fill you with the love of God and the Spirit of God. No other food or drink can satisfy your heart in a way that lasts forever. No other food or drink can take away your pride, can take away your selfishness, can take away your greed, can take away your lust, can take away your hatred, can take away your bitterness, or take away your unforgiveness. No other food or drink can melt away your fear or your guilt or your anxiety or your grief or your despair. This is because there is no other food that nourishes us with the very life of God. In verse 56, Jesus says, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Whenever you eat and drink, you are receiving things into your own body. And through digestion, those things become a part of you. Inseparably so. You become united, as it were, and the nutrients in that food and in that drink, become your life. Being converted into energy and into strength through which you then proceed to live and to dream and to work and to play. Because you've taken it into you and it's become part of you and enabled you to live. In the same way, when you eat Christ's flesh, when you drink His blood, you are receiving Christ into your own very self. And by faith, His life becomes a part of you. He Himself becomes your life 
who produces spiritual energy and strength inside of you through which you are then able to live a life unto God. Through Him you're able to desire God, to delight in God, to live to please God, to work to advance His kingdom through His abiding and indwelling. You are able to enjoy the God that all people are born into this world at enmity against. As believers abide in Christ through faith, Christ abides in believers. And His righteousness and His virtue and His character are absorbed and digested, as it were, into their very souls, which are then converted into holy living. That is how we change. And so that's why putting this in a metaphor really helps us to see what it means to believe. This is what happens when we feed on His flesh, which He has given for the life of the world, overcoming sin and death for those who believe at the cross. And this is what happens when we drink His blood which was shed for our redemption. This is what happens when we receive Him in faith because we receive His very life into our hearts, which then becomes our own life. It is not accidental that in the Old Testament, God told Israel not to eat the flesh and the blood because the life of the flesh is in the blood, the very life and in the New Covenant, we are told that faith is drinking of the very life of our Redeemer, taking the life of God into ourselves, which gives us life, through which we live unto Him. In verses 57 and 58, Jesus expands on this, saying, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread your fathers ate and died, for whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus calls his Father the living Father because God has life in Himself. He is life. And therefore, whoever feeds on God in the flesh, receiving Him into themselves by faith, will live as a result. That is why His flesh is true food and His blood is true drink, because there is nothing else that can give that. Now, in verse 59, John concludes our passage by pointing out that Jesus said these things in the synagogue as He taught at Capernaum. In the synagogue. A place where Jewish men gathered to hear the Scriptures taught and to learn the things of God. A place where one would expect faith to be found. In the synagogue that day, not only was Scripture being taught, but the author of Scripture was teaching. And in a beautiful metaphor, the author of Scripture and the one that all Scripture points towards and in whom are fulfilled, he gives them an intimate illustration of what it means to believe. But sadly, most of those present didn't see but actually were offended by truth. And in the verses that follow, many of them turn their back from following Jesus, which tells us that faith is not always found where faith is expected to be found. Jesus is the bread of life from heaven that gives life to the world. And the bread that He gives is His flesh, which He gave in His sacrificial death on the cross, where He bore our sins. 
where he died in our place in order to remove that which separated us from God so that we may live and not die. The way to receive salvation is by faith. That is how we eat his flesh and that is how we drink his blood. As John Calvin explained when he wrote that, faith alone is the mouth, so to speak, and the stomach of the soul. So we feed on Christ and partake of the very life of God with the mouth and the stomach of faith. And it is as we digest His own life that our souls are nourished, united to God, and we grow and we change. Here's why this illustration is so important. Eating is necessary. This is something that we know from daily life. And in the same way that food is necessary, and that if you don't eat physical food, you die physically. Christ is necessary. And if you do not believe, you perish. And that is a death that lasts forever you would have a better chance of sustaining physical life without eating any food or drinking anything than you would in sustaining spiritual life without feeding on Christ in faith. He is life. And without Him, there is no life. And we cannot live. Also, food is necessary because by it our bodies are nourished and strengthened so that we can live healthy and productive lives in this world. If you do not eat regularly, you not only start feeling physically weak, but you also start becoming mentally foggy and dull. And in the same way, Christ is necessary. Because it is only by faith in Him that our souls are nourished and strengthened to be able to then live fruitful spiritual lives in this world. If we fail to abide in Christ, if we fail to abide in His Word and in prayer, we will grow spiritually dull and weak and lack the strength we need and the spiritual discernment and clarity that we need to live fruitful and productive lives for Him. Not only that, but in the same way that physical food must be eaten personally in order to grow in health and in strength, it has been rightly observed that Christ must be be personally received, personally fed upon, and personally abided in in order to grow spiritually healthy and strong because no one else can abide in Him for you in the same way that no one else can digest your food for you. You cannot gain spiritual health and strength from what someone else has digested. So He's necessary for life. He's necessary for growth. And you can know those things and have no benefit unless you eat yourself. Because no one can digest for you. Many believers struggle under a sense of spiritual weakness and lack spiritual clarity. Because they only feed on Christ sporadically. Here and there, a little bit. The cure is to increase your intake of the true spiritual food and drink by abiding in Christ and in His Word and in prayer. It's not a mystical cure that you need. 
It's just to increase your intake of that which is true food. James Montgomery Boyce made a fitting application along these lines in his commentary where he wrote that, Do not think me blasphemous when I say that Christ must be as real and as useful to you as a hamburger and french fries. I say this because although he is obviously far more real and far more useful than these, the unfortunate thing is that for many people, he is much less. This leads us to two very simple but important questions. First, have you personally received the spiritual food by believing upon Christ for your salvation? There's nothing else in this world that can remove the guilt of your sin and that can rescue you from the death that it brings. You would have a better chance of living a thousand years without ever eating or drinking again than of getting to heaven without Christ. He is true food and He is true drink. And faith in Him is the only way to be made right with God. You need Him more than your daily food. So don't wait another day before you eat and drink of His life by looking to Him in faith, by asking Him for the gift of salvation that He alone gives, knowing that if you do, He promises you eternal life and that He will personally raise you up on the last day. Secondly, if you have believed upon Christ for your salvation, the question for you then is, are you feeding on Him by abiding in His Word and in prayer? Because knowing that Scripture is life-giving and that prayer brings you nearer to the very heart of God is not the same as experiencing the life-giving power of His Word by abiding in it or experiencing the beautiful intimacy with God that comes from abiding in prayer. It's important to remember that no one can digest food for you. Because when these things are weak in your life, you become spiritually malnourished and may find yourself wondering at times why you feel so weak and distant from God. But in the same way that you need to eat your daily bread in this world to live a fruitful and productive life. You, you need to feed on Christ every day in order to grow and mature in your faith and walk in His will and live a fruitful and productive spiritual life. Also, it's important to remember that most people don't just eat to survive, at least... A lot don't. Many people eat because they enjoy food. They crave it. If you've come to faith in Christ for salvation, God's given you a spiritual appetite for Christ. A desire to hear His voice in the Scriptures and a craving to experience His presence in prayer. And so do you crave fresh tastes of His goodness in your life through His Word? Do you long for deeper experiences of His grace and prayer? Do you have a spiritual appetite for Jesus Christ? You see, knowing is not enough. The greatest chef with the greatest knowledge of food and nutrition in the world could die of hunger if he doesn't eat and put his knowledge to practice. And as silly as that might sound, a chef dying of hunger, it sounds silly because we typically value our lives in this world too much to let something like that happen, so few, if anybody, in the right mind would do that. But while that may sound silly physically, physically, 
being unlikely. Spiritually, it's not unlikely. And therefore, it's not silly. Because the God who fills all creation with His invisible attributes, He has revealed Himself to humanity all throughout history, in creation and through the prophets and through His Word and in the greatest way, through His Son, through whom He has displayed His love, freely offering Himself to the world. And He is currently filling every corner of the world with His gracious invitation of love through the Gospel to all who believe, to all who eat this bread and drink. Yet, many will starve and die. Surrounded by God's limitless offer of true food and true drink, and many of those even know quite a bit about it. Because if you don't actually eat and digest this true food and true drink, it won't benefit you. You won't have life by knowing about it. If you don't actually feed on Christ, your soul won't be nourished and you'll be spiritually weak and dull, being malnourished. If you don't actually nourish your soul by abiding in Christ, you're going to come up empty because there's nothing else in this world that can truly satisfy and fill you. And so what a beautiful metaphor that Christ has given us that is so appropriate and helpful. And so, for some of you, what you need to take from this beautiful metaphor is this. Some of you, some of you need to come to Christ. Not simply knowing that He's what you need, but actually coming to Him and feeding. Put the food in your mouth and swallow and digest. Come to Christ in faith, ask Him to save you, and trust Him as your only hope. And then live your life feeding on Him as your daily bread by abiding in His Word and seeking Him in prayer. Don't just think about this food and how it might benefit you. Taste and see that God is good. And for those of you who have come to Christ but you feel a lack of spiritual appetite. For those of you that know that you are neglecting His Word and prayer, you need to take these truths and ask God to restore your spiritual appetite so that your craving is strong again. You need to determine also to abide in Christ daily by feeding on His Word and spending time with Him in prayer. Because when you do, not only will your spiritual strength be restored, and not only will you gain spiritual clarity and discernment and direction, but your heart will become more and more satisfied in Christ, who will become more and more precious to you. Because the more you taste of His goodness and grace, the more you crave after it and long for Him until the day that you see Him and are swallowed up into the infinite delight of the fullness of His presence. And once you taste that, you won't want anything else that's still true today. And so feed on Him. Because Christ is true food, and Christ is true drink, and this is what it means to believe. So feast daily on this true food and true drink, and experience the strengthening, nourishing presence of God in His Son. For this is where transformation is found and the satisfaction that only comes from God. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for your word to us. And Lord, how freely you offer yourself to us through your Son. We pray for an appetite for Christ, a strong craving for Him that draws us into your word and to prayer. God, open our eyes to see how precious your Son is. And God, strengthen our souls so that we would know as we ought and come to Him always and find nourishment in His love. And I pray for those that do not know You, God, that You would grant them faith to look to Your Son, experience His life, and live. And God, may they never get over that sweet taste of Your love and grace and the very life of God in them. May they seek it always until one day they are wrapped up in it fully and forever. In Jesus' name, Amen.